everyone. Hope everyone got a seat in the packed house tonight. It's really hot here. It's human sweating and thinking. So, so once again, how many things that have been done for you today? Maybe a hundred things, maybe five. But in every one of those doings, there was a sense of one doer, yeah? Same thing with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thoughts being seen in the realm of mind, but there is one thought that doesn't get seen, which is you're the thinker. So a thousand thoughts come and go, but the sense of being the thinker of them stays. That's the linkage, that's the bondage to the idea of being a self. It's the whole idea of being a self is being a long-lasting, independent, separate entity. And the way it gets significance of that is being the doer of all the behavior coming through it. So it has to claim a life, or what would represent having a life, which is actions, thoughts, contact with consciousness, seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching. Without that, it would be obvious there is no substantial, long-lasting, independent idea of being Paul. But because of all the claiming, the illusion of being the one who's seeing, the one who's hearing, the one who's feeling, the one who's thinking, the one who has the problem, the one who has a body, the one who has time, the one who has a history, the one who has a future, all of that gives, creates, or not creates, but makes up the sense of the, of the one who's having the life. And immediately, then life, instead of see, being seen as life is happening, it's seen as it's happening to you, or from you, or for you, or by you. And that little bit of deviation creates a huge distortion as it progresses. Yeah? It starts very small, but as it's entertained, it makes, it's a huge progression. So everything then starts being given meaning by this point of view, this one reference of me, Paul, and all the conditional ideas and beliefs and all the memories and the DNA, now they use the event called living to give meaning to things, to give name and form to everything so that you and I can live as a name and form. And so it's like you lose the forest from the trees, yeah? The trees become so significant, every tree is given name and form, you don't sense what it's like to be a forest. Yeah? So we keep sensing what it's like to be a body, and yet we're taking that sense of being a body to be us. Yeah? We're taking physical sensations as the evidence that this is who I am, and what I am, instead of what's actually seeing the physical sensations. The consciousness that's noting the physical sensations. The mental process is also, can also be seen by this consciousness. But the mental process rises and takes its place prior to the consciousness and says, I'm conscious. And when it feels conscious of the physical sensations, it says, that's me. Yeah? This is me. This verifies I am this. I'm feeling it, yeah? But in fact, there isn't you feeling it. There's just the feeling of it. If you really stripped it down from the interpretation, the basic activity is conscious contact. Not you contacting life, but consciousness contacting life. How? By being conscious of it. Yeah. The head has claimed that conscious contact as I'm the one who's in conscious contact. And then everything that gets becomes in, becomes in conscious contact now gets a meaning given to it. Yeah? Based on all the old ideas that make up and comprise the ever-shifting verbing of selfing. Yeah? They, get a, they get applied to what's happening here. And then it becomes your life, in a sense. Your life as depicted by your head. And what occurs is you miss the life that's happening, all the while the interpretation is being laid over it. Yeah. All the while that thin veneer is, putting, is being put on top of it, the evidence of what's actually is occurring is occurring. And it never stops until you pass away. 
conscious contact, I don't see how you can go any farther to the bottom line than that. It's way prior to you. You didn't even appear as you until a few years in the body. You wasn't a you until maybe two and a half or three, and then it started to formulate and started to construct and started to spin a web or weave a little web of senses and interpretations and perceptions so that there was a sense of being Paul while life was happening through this body. Yeah? While life was happening through the body, that sense of Paul claimed it and said, this was, life's happening to me and it's happening from me. So once we become identified, it's not we, you know. Once there's an identification as this mental idea, then your primary realm is mental. So most of the time, you don't experience much, you think about it. You think about the experience. But the experience pretty much passes you by. Because how something is thought about is conscious contact occurs and there's a thought about it. That immediately is a past. And now there's another conscious contact that's being filled up with the interpretation of the past one. And so on and so forth. So we're never actually here anymore, in a sense. We're always in the, in the moment before because we have to wait for the brain to interpret it. Yeah? The raw data is conscious contact but the brain doesn't accept that raw data. Yeah? It immediately interprets it, interprets it from the point of view of being a self. That takes time. And so the time, we're always missing the moment, in a sense, because we're waiting for an interpretation of the last moment. But like I've shared a lot of times, if the mind is in that habit and it's fallen asleep under this trance of being a self, by being engaged with all the selfing because it's taken that to imply you. Yeah. It's, that's where, that's the homing device for attention and interest is you. Yeah. Whatever is deemed to be you, there's going to be a lot of interest and attention going that direction. No matter how much it causes you to be incredibly insane at night thinking about the day represented to you as you, there won't be, it will be very difficult to break away from it because that homing, all that attention is going to go to the thoughts that are about you. It's going to illuminate them. So there's a reflection of self, yeah, with all the selfing. That's the whole point. The selfing never makes up a self. It's impossible to make up a self. It makes up an illusion of being a self. Yeah? And it reinforces it with the selfing with all the thoughts about I, me, my, what something's going to mean, eight different ways, hundreds of different ways, constantly representing events and days, always based on the calculations of a past condition. So each moment is basically missed, and we wait for the next moment to pass so we can get the interpretation of it. So the raw data happens, interpretation happens over that, it takes a little time to get it, more raw data has already occurred, we miss it, we get the raw data for the last moment, and so on and so forth. So there's a little bit of being off, and that is where you as self resides. That's where you appear to be you, is in that little moment of conscious contact not being noticed, and an interpretation being received. There's a gap, every, every moment there's a gap of selflessness, but it's not usually noted. We're just waiting. It's sort of like waiting for the, the sound of the paper hitting the porch with the newspaper boy every moment. We're waiting to get the news broadcast by our head. What does it mean that this happened? <laughs> you know, it's amazing. You can see it with people who, you know, I always use the example of going to work, but I'm always amazed when people, they're at work, and then, you know, they go home and they eat, and maybe they have a couple beers, I don't know what. And around 8 o'clock, their mind lets them in on the information of the day, which you had a bad day. Now, that always amazes me, because I would think if you were conscious, you would know you were having a bad day when it was happening. Yeah, just maybe. But basically, you're like on a 10-hour delay. 
on other very important bits of information, you may be on a, a year delay. Yeah. Some you may be on a whole lifetime delay. Some may be an hour delay. Some may be a second delay. Some saying, oh, you motherfucker, and then, oh, afterwards the relationship is ruined and you wish you would have had that little moment back. But it's all reacting, all reacting. There's no pause. Yeah. What happens if you die? <laughs> You'll be waiting to have your head tell you you're dead, and it won't, <laughs> because it would have shut off with the body. <laughs> as soon as the body goes, there goes the narrator. There's no voice after the body goes. <laughs> you would be sitting there in limbo. What happens <laughs> for eternity? What happens? <laughs> I just saw so much mental illness lately. What can happen in that mental realm when you have no immunity to it is pretty nasty. And also, the side effects and the demand for relief from those side effects. So if you see, most addictions are really solutions to the primary addiction, which is addicted to self. Yeah? So there's an addiction to self, and that addiction to selfing makes up a lot of uh, debris and refuse and discomfort and irritability and restlessness, yes? The mind gets agitated, so now it seeks relief from that. So let's say you get loaded or you start drinking or you start shopping or doing this. So you act out to get relief from the original addiction. Yeah? But the original addiction has the one of the greatest immunities to any kind of investigation because you're identified as it. So basically, the irritability, restlessness, and discontent that it's making, yes, you have to throw it on to something else. You can't see it as you, yeah, because you, you're looking from it as you. So now I have an addiction trying to get relief from that, and that addiction produces consequences that d demand my attention and interest. And after a while, all of your ability to be present is just sort of diluted and washed into time into secrets and resentments that you never dealt with and all of this. And basically, at this point, being in, sucked up into that mental realm, you don't really have much interest and attention that can show up here. Unbridled with all that. Yeah? It's here, but it's enslaved to there and then. Our attention and interest is enslaved to there and then, so it can't really be here. Even though we'd like to be here, we're basically, in a sense, incapable. Because the only here we actually know is one that's bookended with there and then, and that's not here. Here, truly here, has no flavor of time in it. There's no flavor of the past and the future. It's like an, it's like an infinite, timeless moment in a linear line of time, yeah? But each and every moment is infinite and timeless. It's only the mind that constructs the past and future, the bookended. So it neuters the here and makes it a mental here. And the mental here, you actually, for some of us, that's the thing we're trying to get out of so unbelievably much. We're trying to get out of what we call here, but here is truly the solution to our dilemma. But we're, we, we're actually in a mental here that's driving us crazy. We misname it and we think it's here. So I know when I was out there, I did not want to be conscious for the life of me. Any moment, I had, I'd get, you almost use anything to get loaded because I was so petrified to be here. But the here I was petrified of was the mental here. The here that I was avoiding at all costs was the solution. Because there, there was the presence of consciousness. There, there was the availability of being out of self. There is no availability of being out of self in past and future. That's the realm of selfing. There is no realm of past and future other than in the mental realm. So when people ask me, why don't you help people? The, the, the problem with helping people is that there's a person to help, really. 
Because if there's a person to help, the help's never going to have to end. Because the person will always be helped as a person. The point is, is maybe you're not a person. Maybe you're not an individual entity. Maybe you're not the body. Just maybe, I'm not saying what you are, but I really feel you can be uh, set free when you recognize what you're not. Entertain it maybe at first, but usually there'll be a recognition of it because it's on the money, actually. I mean, look at what we do with what's not happening. We make that seem so real, and it has no resemblance to reality. I mean, what could, what could happen if your mind actually entertained something that was true? It could have profound effects here, yes? Because it's truly a cause. Yeah. So you could wake up and pop out of that ass of self and come out of the mental realm, yes? and have immunity to what's not happening. And as soon as you have immunity to what's not happening, there's a sense of what's happening, because you are what's happening. Consciousness is in contact at this very moment through this body. And you have a mind that can reflect that, that can become aware of that, that can actually become aware of the consciousness that's in contact instead of seeing everything as Paul, which causes you to be very unaware of the consciousness in contact. No matter how hyper-aware you are of all your thoughts, you're very unconscious to what's prior to thoughts. And of course, that's going to set off a lot, a lot of dis-ease, and there's going to be an addiction from an addiction from an addiction from an addiction. You see people, they have a primary addiction, let's say it's drugs, and then they get some help there, but then it has offshoots. Now they start acting out sexually, or they spend too much money, or they do tons of stuff, pornography, everything. The mind is just popping out everywhere, because the true cause of its disease hasn't been addressed, which is identified with something that you're not. You're not having the disease. The, the idea of being a you is the, disease, is the disease. That sense of being a you is the disease in action. Selfing is the disease of mind. Yet it doesn't leave any blemish on consciousness. But it will leave lots of blemishes on us. Because... In this world of appearances, other appearances affect you as an appearance. You can get hurt. You can feel terrible. All of these things can occur to you. But it's like that chair. If you lift up the chair, in a sense you can see it had no effect whatsoever on the space that it was in. That it's actually just an appearance in the space. Because no space is moved. No space has to move back. There's no sign that the chair was ever in the space. So in effect, in, in, in truth, it has no reality because it has no effect on anything that's real. Yeah? So it's an appearance. So when people say, I feel so terrible, of course you do as this. This is a possibility this has here. It can feel terrible, just like it can feel great. Yeah. Yet, if this disappeared, the space that was here all the time would still be here. There was no space that had to move back in, and there was no space that was ever moved out that was taken up by Paul. Paul is just like an appearance yeah? in time. And an appearance comes and goes. But what was prior to that appearance? And what has been the evidence of living in that appearance every moment of what it calls its life was consciousness in contact. And yet, we want to find the consciousness as the appearance. Instead of just questioning, am I the appearance? If I'm not the appearance, then it's obvious that I am consciousness. That I've always been consciousness, and I will always be consciousness. It's not a moment that I was real as this and I became consciousness. There was never this. 
So there was no this becoming consciousness. And there was no this forgetting consciousness. There was no this. All there is is consciousness. What a great relief. Because if it was up to you, it would be too stressful. And you'll fuck it up somehow. You won't do something or have something that you think you should have done and had to get there. Yeah? You'll always be disqualified from the arrival. You'll be like on the plane and they'll come and take you out at the last minute. If you don't have the right paper stamp. You know? And you'll go back doing and having with the hopes of getting on that plane again with the hopes that that plane is going to take you to enlightenment. The whole while you're what you're seeking. But not as this. This is seeking. This is seeking. This isn't seeking. This is seeking. This is seeking. It's not like this is something and it's seeking. This is seeking. The appearance of this is seeking. This is like the manifestation of seeking here. A mind seeking takes an appearance of a body. And then it sets out like a body would set out on a journey and it's looking. Looking, looking, looking. And it runs across these very intricate little subtle parables or statements that, you know, what seeking is what you're looking for. And it goes, looks around and it's an open secret. Oh, what does that mean? Or you'll come upon the gateless gate. What does that mean, a gateless gate? (laughs) Obviously a gateless gate means there's no point of entry. And there's no point of departure. And if there's no gate at the gateless gate, there can't be a gatekeeper. Yes, there's no gatekeeper. There's nobody who's going to have a set of requirements that is going to stop you and go, okay, have you filled them? That is you as a self. You're the one who created the exile. Now let's just say, let's just say, all of us here, the mind is predominantly in self-centeredness, yeah? Now, I've shared this many times, but I want to take off on it tonight. I remember when my father, I was six years old, my father got very ill. Before that, he was playing baseball with me and doing a lot of things with me, like dads sometimes do. And, of course, I have never known anything different. I just thought that was the way it was, yeah, and the way it was going to be. And then he got ill, and and then he stopped playing with me, yeah, because he was very, very ill. And so I'm sure my mother sat me down and said, hey, dad's ill and that's why he can't take you to, you know, tryouts. I'm going to take you out to tryouts and stuff like that. And I'm sure that maybe they brought the doctor, my family doctor, and he told me. Maybe they brought the priest, Father O'Farrell, to break the news to me. But I'm telling you, I don't care how many people said what and how many evidence, because of the mind's self-centeredness, I believed I must have done something for him not to want to play with it. It was just, that was the end of the story. You could bring 8,000 different facts contrary to that, but in my little head, I was sure that I had to have something to do with it. Now let's just say, this isn't just a random act of one time in the mental realm, but maybe it's one of the foundations of the mind in self that everything is centered on self. So when anything is seen, when there's anything felt, it's brought back to you sooner or later. After you blame everyone and do this and do that, inevitably, let's say they say, oh, the world is beautiful. It's full of eternal bliss. There's just love everywhere. And that's not your experience. Yeah, You think, fuck that. I hate that guy right there or whatever, you know? And then so you go, okay... I've been reading all these books about love, the eternal bliss. So there's the eternal bliss of love, and I'm not feeling it. Yeah, I'm not seeing it, I'm not feeling it, and I don't even want to feel it. What does that make me? That I don't want to know the eternal love and the eternal bliss. That makes me pretty freaking bad in a lot of ways. What's going to happen if your head attaches to the idea that you're bad? <laughs> It's going to give a whole lot of meaning in your life to sort of reinforce that idea, isn't it? Because it loves to be right. And it's going to make sure it's right about you being bad. So you'll have blinders on when people are loving you unconditionally. 
You'll see them as threats, probably. You'll be, all this will happen. Your life will be so interpreted in such a strange slant, all because you've taken it upon yourself to be the reason why separation is occurring. Now, that would be a huge amount of guilt, wouldn't it? If your whole engine of mind is to be the doer, yeah, you can't escape that. The, all the interpretations of selfing is that you're the doer of the actions in this life. So what happens if you end up feeling separate? It sure seems like you're going to apply that same logic that I must have done something to make it like this. Yeah? Just like I must have done something for my father not to want to play with me. I must have done something to make it this insane. So after the mind tries to dump it on everyone and blame everyone else, it's usually going to put its big, fat middle finger right on you. Yeah? Right on the little mental you. Try to get out of that one. Yeah? Everything will be seen from the point of view of self. It's like a lady called me the other day. And after talking to me for a while, she boiled it down to this. She says, some things are happening to me, and I think they could be different. I said, there you go. That's one of the first foundations of the mental interpretation of life from selfing. Things are happening to me, and I think they should be different. Not taking action about them, but thinking they could be different. And thinking about a lot of different ways they could be different. But the point is, they're not different. Who's going to be at fault? for that in self-centeredness. In the self-centered mental system, when something's happening to you and you think it could be different, but there is a deep recognition that it isn't, who is going to be truly put to fault after you blame everyone else? That's just a way of trying to get it off of you. But inevitably, it's going to go back to you, isn't it? It has to. You're in the system of self-centeredness. Everything directly or indirectly relates back to selfing as being the cause somehow. Just like if someone's in this room, they yawn, I think I'm causing their boredom. Yes, you know it all the time. Whatever event happens, you immediately bring it back to you. If someone starts talking about their mother, you talk about your mother. Well, guess what? It's, that's just samples of the system of <laughs> sucking back into selfing. So here you go. Something's happening to me. And I think it can be different. But the deep down experience is it isn't different. Who must be at fault for that? After you blame you, the parents, this and that, where does it always end up in the mental realm? It has to end up on that little slap called self. The guilt that we feel while we're traveling here is nothing compared to... This is like that iron ball they talk about. This is the contraction of selfing. There's something wrong with you. You did something for it to be that way. There's something wrong here. And I did something for it to be that way. That contraction... The activity of mind is to try to throw guilt off, try to get relief from this, but all the while it's reinforcing it. Because as things keep getting critical, criticized and judged as not being right, deep down you're at fault for that. So, something's happening to me and I think it could be different. Why isn't it different? It has to be because of you. <laughs> you don't see the unbearability of that? All the things we complain about, all the things we bitch about, are just minor ways of distracting from the amazing little bit of eye and boldness, of contraction of selfing. The selfing taking it all the way as being the doer of it. Whatever situation it finds itself in, if it finds itself in what we call separation, it believes he did something to produce this. And it's obviously incredibly powerless to change it, and yet it tries to exert power every day. What would happen 
imagine if just you questioned not the whole system of selfing, but just the center. And because there is this power that whatever you believe you are, that's where a lot of attention and interest is going to go. If you could take that you from selfing and maybe just throw it up in the air with some entertaining and see where it lands, and so after a while, the interest and attention to that will leave and go to this. Yes? And you'll have immunity to the selfing. And you'll be able to accept things as they are. And that whole line that always brings everything back to you will be cut. And then that false center dissolves. And then life is happening. And the blessing and the forgiveness that you've been so dying to get but you don't believe you deserve is, becomes moot. It becomes released. It becomes pointless. Yeah? Nothing ever happened here. You didn't do a damn freaking thing. You're off the hook. Interest attention just bounces right here. That obviously makes you conscious, you're present, you're awake, you're available, and you're of service. Then all the ideas of being happy are dispensed because you start really feeling happy. And you give up all the old thought structures. You don't give them up, they just fade and drop away because they have no use anymore. What they were there for was to reinforce the false edifice of self. That was their whole purpose. That was what they were serving. When that, when all your interest and attention, your ability to devote, your ability to honor, your ability to have faith in has shifted, yes? All those things start dissolving. They lose their structure. And what's there is what's always been there, space. All the conceptual chairs, they start disappearing. And you realize they were just appearances in the space of mind. And that space of mind, unencumbered by all the attachment to the appearances in it, has a feeling to it. Not a feeling, a sense, a presence, an onness, a clarity. Uh, infinite ceilingless space yeah. and then the all the meaning of time gets shifted you don't see a day based on what happened you have the same feeling through every day in a way the, the same baseline of consciousness is in every moment of every day so the particulars of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday start fading yes and you get the sense of the context of how it feels to travel here. Yeah? As conscious. Yeah? You get that sense of that. The things come and go in the, in the appearance realm, in, the, in front of the camera, but the sense of the presence that that camera implies, yeah? which is the conscious contact happening through this, implies consciousness. Just because it's only coming through six doors here doesn't mean it's the size of the doors. It's just squeezing through six doors here, seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching, but that do not measure it by the door that it's coming through. Do not measure the kingdom of heaven when it says the kingdom of heaven is within you. Don't take the you to be the body because then it's a very small kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is within you, the you that we are. That space that is not contrived. It's not partitioned and parceled out by time. Yeah? It's not in a moment. It's through the moment, it's immersed, it's soaked through, but the moment is just doesn't capture any of the fabric of the cloth. Yeah? It's been interpreted by mind to mean. A moment now with a before and after. A train so the mind can just make up a mental realm 
in this moment of time, it can make up past and present and future and dwell there. Have its whole, all of its concerns based on what's not happening. Having all, all its reasons to live based on what's not happening. So what are you going to give someone to do? If you know as soon as there's, there's a doing, there's going to be a sense of a doer. Without questioning the doer, all the doing is probably not going to help you at all, deep down. Yeah. Doing here can have great effects on this, and the brain can get more peaceful. But if that sense of being the doer keeps over-enforcing itself on all the doing, it's going to use all that doing to reinforce the idea of being the doer. Still bondage to self. You see anger, let's say. But the mind immediately says, there's a you that's angry. As soon as the you that is angry dominates seeing the anger, it has a different life in the mental realm. Angry, yeah? It can be, it can be denied and repressed and all this other shit. But when you see anger, there's a, there's a possibility of its dismissal just by seeing it. It's like when something is honored by being seen, it tends to change. Yeah. When it's covered up immediately with a mental concept, then it sort of grows in that. Yeah. The anger gets weirder and weirder. It gets more repressed and then it acts out perversely somewhere else. It's just seeing it. All it is is an energy. I saw some today. It was interesting to see. When I saw Jeff, I felt an incredible amount of anger. <laughs> well, any questions tonight? It's a very subdued space. Eh? It's really something. Peace of mind is... An, un, un, an unagitated mind the unagitated mind reflects space yeah mental process makes an agitation on the mind. So peace of mind can't be enjoyed because of the ingredient of time involved. Yeah? But the mind's ability to entertain or reflect consciousness is available. But when it's agitated, the interest and attention gets stuck on all the movements of the waves and doesn't it forgets the sense of being the ocean, yeah? And then if there's such a drive to get relief as that idea of being a self that you'll do anything to get relief. You'll take some pills that you've taken hundreds of times before and know there's going to be terrible consequences. But there's no power. You're addicted. There's no you that's addicted. Just addiction is taken over mind. The primary one that we're trying to get relief from is the addiction to self. Every other one is a sub-addiction, trying to get relief from the initial addiction to self. No 
questions there. Capture, yes. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> I really do. No one's ever going to buy one of these either. <laughs> I haven't, we can't even get a store going on the thing. I have, I didn't, I don't have the two, but I have another one I did. I'll give you. It's pretty good.